Namaste. Welcome to Shaman's Shed. Today I'm talking with Michael Feely. After a career in the police force of 17 years, Michael turned away from the police to explore the mystery of higher consciousness following a series of spiritual and paranormal events. As a result, he has written seven books which include Alchemy of the Gods and The Secrets of the Pyramids. Michael has recently filmed and also presented a documentary series called Higher Consciousness on the iconic TV network and also appeared on an iconic film called Divine Intervention, which also features David Icke and Eric von Daniken. We welcome Michael to Shaman's Shed. I'd like to start off really and ask you about your story and, you know, your your background and, and how you got into this, this subject. Well, my, my story really, as you say, was... Uh, in law enforcement in, in the police force, which when I started, it was a 30-year a career, or so I expected it to be. <clears throat> and it took a long, long time to get in. It, 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 certainly then, I don't know so much now, but certainly then it was quite a difficult occupation to actually get in. But once you're in, then you're there for life, really. And I did 18 weeks residential training and attending in North London, which was weekly exams, half past six morning, uh, uniform inspections and parades and marching everywhere and uh, say weekly exams which you have to pass, many, many assessments of other kinds, you know, written work, role playing, diff different things to, to sort of test your compatibility with, with the role. And then after that, we had a nice big passing out parade when all the families attended and, you know, a, a lovely ceremony with the with the military guards and, and, and the bands. And after that, I, I was on the main streets of of North London as a patrol officer on the front line, answering the, the 999 emergency calls and non-emergency calls, being there at the time of need. It was so so much of a variety of a, a, a variety of a role that you could literally go from literally crossing an old lady over the road to being the first on scene at a hostage situation or the first on scene at a murder or so on. So it really, really was that varied and you never, never knew what was coming next. And that was something that, I, that I'd wanted to do for a long, long time. I moved from London later on in, in my career to come back to, to my home force, which was Birmingham, West Midlands, Birmingham. And I continued in the same role, even though different departments wished for me to, to join them. I didn't want to do that because I didn't want to be in an office. I wanted to be out and about. I wanted to, when someone called for help, I wanted to be the one that, that was there to, to make a difference. And that's not a cliche, that that really was the way that I was. However, probably about 12, 13, 14 months before I actually did leave in 2009, I began to get very, very disillusioned with a public service that was being weighed down heavily, you know, like INTs really, with, with politics. And politics was becoming more and more prevalent. He was... He was taking me further and further and further away from from the shore that there was help where I was there to help people and that really really was having a detrimental effect on me on my energy and my I know now to be my vibration which I didn't then but I was always in a in a bad negative mood and it was purely because of the environment that I was in and because my energies were no longer compatible with a system that wasn't serving people, which wasn't helping people, which was actually doing the opposite in, in many respects. <clears throat> As I came closer and closer towards 2009, there was lots and lots of other things that came into the mix, which, as I say, was no fault of my own. I was, I was minding my own business. And I began to have introduced into my life a lot of what you would, you would class as paranormal, supernatural incidents. Uh, for want of uh, a better word, for want of a better phrase. Everybody seems to understand these words, so that they're, they're the ones that I use. And I was experiencing, shall we say, poltergeist activity where where windows would be smashing in my house from the inside. I'd be going out, even in, in, in the police force, I was being introduced to this anyway, but but I would see the mental portals opening up in the, in the sky and seeing unorthodox craft coming out of them. And then literally the portal would disappear and the craft would carry on across the sky. I was seeing all, 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 all the different matter of things, uh, sort of day and night. But the real pinnacle, what I, what I, what I would class as the real awakening for, for me, yeah. was in 2009 when I, I consciously, in a, 
shall we say, conscious entanglement, remote viewing, went back 159 years in, into my past to the scene of a murder where a 14-year-old Victorian girl was suffocated by her father and we'd had this, this, this certainly the spirit of this girl in, in our energy field but little did we know or little did I know that we'd also had the assailant who was a stepfather in our energy field as well and he was the one who was causing basically the damage in our house, smashing the windows and because he, he, he really did not want this, this girl to have her story relayed and it was covered up in Victorian England and, and in the cat and mouse game that they were still playing. He didn't want it to, to come out now either. So I went back 159 years and I've even remember being in the old creaky wooden Victorian bedroom, the door opening, the curtains, moving with the draft. Uh, a young girl's voice saying, here he is. And then basically I just blacked out and I was screaming in, in, in hysterics. I was it was so traumatised by, by what I'd seen or what I'd relived or, or experienced that I couldn't actually switch the light off for six months in, in my bedroom for fear that every time I closed my eyes, I was going back to that place. And gradually and gradually and gradually, you know, I, I always said that when I can speak about this incident without feeling the trauma, without feeling the fear, then I've recovered from it and I can move on. And that probably took about six months. And from that point, again, I continued to experience a wide range of things, purely an experiencer. And this really was preparing me to learn and understand in order to speak about what I'd experienced. And as that journey progressed and progressed and progressed, it went from experiencing to answering what I'd experienced and why I'd experienced it, moving on to getting lots and lots of answers to many of the, the secret, should we say, secret uh, knowledge, sacred knowledge of the ancient past, that people are still contemplating as to what the pyramids mean, what the Sphinx means, what Stonehenge means, what all these things mean, and I, but I was giving the answers to these things. And sometimes I, I'd, I'd be given a question and the answer to that question in the same millisecond. <laughs> it, it it literally, and ever since it's just been a bombardment of, of, of discovery. You know, when I was in, in, in the police force for 17 years, I was a trained investigator. I'd go to a crime, I'd look at the evidence, I'd piece the evidence together, and that's how it operated. You know, some, sometimes eyewitnesses were saying one thing, but the evidence would say something else. So being a trained investigator, I took that sort of knowledge and that experience to working out a blueprint for the ancient world, which took me all around Earth, beyond Earth, to other planets, to connect everything, and figuring out just what it is that they were trying to tell us. And when you see the same numbers, when you see the same symbols, when you see the same metaphors, when you see the, the same characters of a different name across all of these different cultures, then it's quite clear that they're trying to tell us something. Something is going on, there is some message in place. So I was purely an experiencer and I began to understand and have the answers to what I was experiencing. I began to get lots and lots of answers to these sacred mysteries. And the stage it's at now, it's, it's sort of quantum mechanics, quantum formulas that I put in my head which I know it is a, it's all to do with angular velocity and, and some kind of intergalactic travel, and which which I'm getting the mathematical formulas for and I'm documenting and piecing them together because within that there's a message, there, there's a story. So that that really in, in, in a very, very short nutshell is is my journey so far from being in a career that, I, that I'd always wanted to do to help people to investigate crime, to investigate things that had happened to them. Uh, to all of a sudden having my, my life completely flipped on its head, having all of these different, should we say, experiences from not this world but other worlds. And it could be ufology, that could be ghosts, that could be paranormal, that could be ancient mysteries, it could be any one of those which are really the same thing. And I began to experience it all literally on a daily basis. So that, that really is is why I'm why I'm here now, to to help people and to bring them forth on their journey because to, to me true enlightenment is not only the development of self it is helping others to develop their, their selves and that really is the pure the, the most purest motive for doing what i'm now doing yeah it's, it's fantastic and you know it's quite a you know a change to go from being you know a police officer of you know which has such a 
you know, a systemic, you know, upstanding job where, you know, there is a, you know, a sense of rationality about it and, 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 and being normal really. And to go from that to something uh, so, you know, so different and alternative and spiritual, you know, that normally must take, you know, a lot of people aren't able to make that shift without some sort of awakening or paradigm shift. Um, and a lot of the people I talk to often, that paradigm shift or awakening occurs from a trauma of some sort, you know, that, uh, you know, makes them change. It, it only allows them to see things differently because they've had to, they've been forced to in a way. Um, would you say that's kind of your experiences that you, you know, the, the paranormal experiences you were having were, were the, were the traumatic experiences or was there anything else that was just knocked you into a completely different direction of thought? Well, when you experience the things that I that, that I was was experiencing and still are, you can never go back to what you would typify as being normal. I mean, to, to most people, you said, what what is normal? You know, you are born, you go to school, you get a job, you pay taxes, you work for your life, you retire, and that that is normal. You know, it, it is normal to, to get in the car in the morning, sit in rush hour traffic to pay for a house you're not in because you're going to work and that that to people is an accepted normal it is not it was never meant to be that way it was hijacked but but that is people's accepted norm so for me i could never go back to the accepted norm knowing that that is not normal because you know i've been introduced to a lot of other flavors a lot of other ingredients and it's funny when you speak to a lot of people and and when i listen to shows like this and uh, with other guests it's almost as if we've taken the same book from the shelf and, you know, we, we, we've read the same magic book because when people awaken and when people have these kind of experiences and, and, and sometimes when it is a traumatic experience, we all seem to have the same, shall we say, in Latin, modus operandi, which is which is a method. And, you know, it, it is it was certainly in, in the in the legal fraternity, you know, yeah. modus operandi is you go to the to, to, to a scene and for argument's sake it's a burglary and then you go to another burglary and then another one and the assailant has entered the property the same way they've, they've searched each of the rooms with the same method in the same way and basically it's it's a mirror of all the others you can say that it's the same person due to their method due to their modus operandi and that is really what is happening with the people who are having these awakenings who are having these experiences it is the same modus operandi where they get introduced to a different world and certainly when you when you also find out that you were chosen to do that or certain people are chosen to be the flame carriers really for for this kind of information and that is really what is happening so so for me there was one this this one incident that was traumatic but the rest of them were not traumatic but they were an insight into into the frequency field that that, that we don't normally see you know the unseen worlds that that when m most people believe that there is only one sphere of existence, which is this reality, which is this earth, and they are told by their science that nothing else exists, then there are those with the higher facts who realize that things do exist and that there are things in the unseen world, that there are things beyond the horizon. And those are the people who the Bible calls the Elohim. They are the ones, you know, the way showers, the, the way pavers, who, who are prepared to go into the journey of the unknown beyond the horizon that is the hell of him and the, the hell part is the god within so yes it can be traumatic some it, it, it felt to me as if it was going to happen regardless of what i was what i was doing whatever stage of my life i was at it's almost it's almost as if it was predetermined like an alarm clock you know you set your alarm clock because you need to wake up at, at a certain time and that's really how it how it feels retrospectively that it was something that was set in motion and it was sort of time locked to happen at that particular time for whatever reason. And that's exactly what happened. And, and it was such a, a loud alarm that I wasn't going to sleep through it. You know, I, was, I wasn't just going to switch it on snooze and then go back to a normal life. It, it was it was going to it was going to wake me up with a shock, you know, and, and that's and that's what happened. And it's amazing, really, the, the amount of people who are doing this and who are putting themselves forward in order to do this they have had the same kind of things happen to them in order to, to make sure that, that they do this. 
So it, it's it's of no surprise really that this this modus operandi, the same book out of the shelf, is typical with with me with with probably many other guests that you you've encountered, uh, because that really seems to be the modus operandi of how these intergalactic energies work. You know, from these experiences, you then, you know, started researching and investigating, um, you know, different processes and, and ancient histories and, you know, uh, esoteric wisdom as well. Things that, you know, are unseen. You know, you, you've, you've gone looking for those. How have you gone about that research um, before we sort of touch on it? How, how, where did you, I mean, who would know what way to look? How did you know which direction to go? You know, I've seen a lot of your works, you know, it, it ranges from, you know, looking at Gnosticism to Egyptian mythology to, you know, astrology. Um, how did you know where to, to, to go? You know, what way to look? Because, uh, you know, without the compass, how do you know? <laughs> well, the thing is, within us, we all have the compass. We, we all have the, the, the gentle prods to look in the right place. You know, we all have the, the a lot of the things that we need to do and a lot of the problems that we encounter is we seem to stand in our own way. <clears throat> and when we get out of our own way, that's when things begin to happen. So for me, my, I say my, my, my major awakening was 2009. In 2010, my wife and I decided that we wanted to go to Egypt. We, we, we both had this this feeling we wanted to go on, on holiday, on vacation, but... Egypt was the place, but we also knew that there's more to it. You know, we've been on holiday before. We'd never felt this <clears throat> kind of depth about uh, getting on a plane and going somewhere. And literally less than two weeks before we went, I had a strange, strange email from a psychic medium from Scotland who who said, you know, that she had a message for us from from her spiritual council. And I can't remember who was in that council, but she did explain to us. And it, it, I can't remember it off the top of my head, but basically it was regarding your trip to Egypt, you know, you are going to encounter <clears throat> ancient knowledge. You know, you need to get to the classes to the right hand side of the Sphinx as you can, because the Sphinx is going to download knowledge into your toolbox that you will have to understand before you can speak about it and, and teach. And this this was this strange message, you know, it, what's all this about? <clears throat> but it's sort of it sort of complemented and, and, and confirmed this deeper feeling that we had. Mm. So we went to, to Egypt, you know, the, one of the first trips was an internal flight to Cairo. And, you know, we went to the Sphinx. I, ironically, we were all kettled in a, in a very, very narrow concrete corridor that went up. And as you get to the top of the corridor and look right, you have the Sphinx right there. And just as my wife and I got to the top, it was it was literally just crowded. You you had to go with the crowd. You had no choice. Once you started walking, you were just cattle there. Yeah. And as soon as we got to the top, which was then a sort of flat concourse, two people moved, and it enabled just my wife and I to get as closest to the right hand side of the Sphinx as we possibly could. And so I thought, well, this is a kind of synchronicity. And we did that. We went inside the Great Pyramid, uh, went to the Cairo Museum, went down the Nile, and seemingly. There, there wasn't anything sort of significant, really, at, at, at sort of face level, at, at, at superficial level. But I now know that it was needed to open certain keys, certain frequency keys. And sometime later, that's when things started to happen in relation to the ancient world. And, and I'd, I'd received, so we say, pharaonic visitation. I'd see scattered beetles manifesting from the wall at my house inside when I'm just sitting there in the living room, literally a, a cold wild blue scarab beetle wood would just manifest. And I was beginning to get a lot of Egyptian things happening to me. I didn't realise at this particular time that I'm actually related to Queen Scotia of, of ancient Egypt through Irish Celtic kings. So Egypt is is in my DNA, it is in my blood. And you know everybody loves Egypt, everybody is fascinated by Egypt and the pyramids and everything else. And I, I began to get lots and lots of bits of information, as I said, about about this sacred place. And I began to look at 
the, the ancient world as, as a separate in, independent civilization. So I would look at, you know, the Druids, I'd look at those, the Stone Age, I'd look at the Egyptians, I'd look at the Babylonians, Sumerians, thinking that they were all just individual people across the world, and soon realised that actually they, they were all a piece of the same jigsaw puzzle. They were working together. They were not separate at all. And I realised this by the evidence that they'd left. And that evidence was the monoliths and the monuments and the kind of information that these monoliths and monuments were encrypting for us to find. And as I said earlier, you know, when, you, when you're looking at the same metaphors, the same stories, the same characters, the same meanings, the same in-depth esoteric meanings, it's quite clear that they're all saying the same thing. Not only were they connected by an esoteric theme, hidden secret theme, but they are also deeply connected by universal mathematics. And it's quite clear that in the longitude and latitude coordinates of these monuments, they give you not only their precise location on the face of the earth, but the location of other monuments as well. It's almost like a mathematical uh, crystalline stone satellite navigation. And not only does that relate to Earth, but it also relates to the Sidonian city on, on planet Mars. Now, when you look at the word Cairo, al Kahira means the place of Mars. So with them, we start to see that the face on Mars, which mathematically is a, is, a, is a direct match of an overlay of the Sphinx of Egypt. When you start looking at the, the longitude and latitude coordinates of the face on Mars, it tells you how to find Stonehenge. Stonehenge tells you how to find the face on Mars. The Great Pyramid tells you how to find Stonehenge. It tells you how to find the, the Sidonian city on Mars. And you have this gigantic mathematical matrix system that quite clearly there's either the same civilization that is traveling the stars or this is multiple civilizations who are connecting to each other. Then you start looking at the sonics of the monoliths and the monuments and how they were able to transmute themselves almost into an imploding, an imploding black hole in order to travel portals. And the Egyptian word for star is esbar, which means gateway. And it's, uh, th these, these gateways, these portals are time-locked, they are star-locked. So when certain stars appear in certain locations in the sky and other stars appear in the certain locations in the sky, they create a portal. So it was important for the ancients to measure where these stars were and when they were going to appear and when they were going to sink into alignment because that's when the portals would open in order for them to do the Luke Skywalker, the light star walkers, because they went through these portals to different worlds through frequencies. And it's it, it began to, to become very, very fascinating to, to understand that not only were they opening portals and creating portals and transmuting their own bodies and able to travel through them, but they, they were also telling us how to do the same things. And they were, they, they were you know, when you, for argument's sake, when you look at the Great Pyramid, the Great Pyramid is a gigantic replica of our head. Because where they've put the King's Chamber, the Queen's Chamber, etc., corresponds exactly to the endocrine system of consciousness within the mind. Yeah. So they were telling us, it, it's a real, real story of, of the fall. Now, when you look at the Bible and biblical story and biblical characters, that is really contaminated hands from Egypt. So you have the original Bible, which was the Giza Plata, and it's all written in stone, Noah's Ark is the Great Pyramid, and so on and so on. That went through Hebrew Kabbalah hands that later became Christian philosophy. So the Bible really is, is the Giza Plata. And when you look at the likes of, of Christ, and when you look at the likes of Mary Magdalene and, and Noah, all of these are within the Giza Plata. So it's a really, really fascinating to, to be able to piece all this together and I really don't know if I could ever do it again it, it's <laughs> it, one of the most difficult questions that anybody ever asks is how do you piece all this together and and the only answer that I can give them is it just pieced itself together within me And that, well, that's fascinating, you know, some of the stuff there already is mind-blowing to me and, you know, having to just process some of that. Um, you know, one of the sort of main themes out of your, your research and, you know, your newfound direction was obviously, you know, looking into 
to alchemy and you know obviously one of your books is called alchemy of the gods um and recently you've you've made a documentary called higher consciousness um there seems to this seems to be sort of the the overriding theme that correct me if i'm wrong but it seems to have come out of you know your your awakening and your direction is the this um essentially you know an alchemical process of higher consciousness and you know escaping the the you know the 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 five sense realm um would you say that's true and if so you know tell us a bit more about this process and you know how what you've discovered about it and you know is it not only just something that you're discovering but also perhaps a personal journey for yourself on learning how to escape you know the the matrix i suppose um it is i mean re really where again when you look at the clues that the ancients have left us it really talks about escaping the cycle of torment which is really you know the the birth the death the birth the death the birth the death cycle now when we come into this reality it is really the fall and that then takes us into the adam and eve and eden and, and different things but it is the fall because we come from a celestial place to a terrestrial place we come through the gateway into the underworld which is the womb which is the holy grail because we we are birthed into this world now when you look at alchemy alchemy really talks about a transmutation from base metal lead to the philosopher's stone which is the the cornerstone that the builders rejected which is the third eye hmm. so it is all about escaping the cycle of torment because we have fallen into the mind of the flesh which is death not the mind of spirit which is life and when you look at alchemy chem or chemet which is the, the royal name of Egypt. Egypt is a, is, a, is a Greek name, not an Egyptian one. So when you look at the word Kemet, K-E-M-E-T, -E -E in Hebrew, the word truth is Emet, E-M-E-T. So Kemet is the truth. Now, when you look at the word Emet, the M, the Mem, the water, is the mediator between life and death. That is Moses. Now, the Exodus that Moses really took it wasn't a physical one. It was the escape from the torment, from captivity, which is the lower chakras, the captivity, the, 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 the lower part of self, the kingdom of earth. And it was the transition through the chakra system to the promised land or the land that is promised, which is enlightenment. So that is the real exodus. It was not a physical exodus. Now, when you start seeing the chariots, that, that tells us about Uncontroll, uncontrollable thoughts and, and, and different things throughout the journey. But nevertheless, Moses, when he reaches the burning bush, it is the fornix within the brain, really, the, 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 which is set alight by the isle, by the united one, which is the isle within inside the body that takes you to the promised land. So the burning bush is, is the enlightened pineal gland through the fornix, which is the furnace of the brain. Now, just, just in front of the fornix, you have a gap called the vault, which is the tomb, which is the cave. That is the cave where the United One rested. So when this oil, the United One, is illuminated, we have the resurrection and Easter within our mind, Golgotha, the place of skulls, which is where we get the light to become enlightened. So the whole Christ story, the whole thing is talking about the mind. Noah is basically the completion of the seven the completion of the seven chakras to enlightenment. When you look at Noah being 120, when he built the ark, 120 is the synthesis of the power of the pentagram. Now, the pentagram is a symbol of the mysteries. It is the star that we'll be putting on our Christmas trees in the next few weeks, yeah. because within, within the pentagram, you have the four elements. Now, the word God is code for the four elements. So the God, the four elements within us, is the universal creation so if we wish to become divine we have to control the four elements within us which is you know if you are forever angry then the fire element is is out of balance you know if you, if you are forever sad and crying then the water balance is out if you can can't control your thoughts your air element is out of balance and if you don't look after your body in in many different ways then your earth element is out of balance so if you wish to become completed man on earth divine man on earth that is the pentagram because the whole of creation is number 10 
and man as a miniature creation is the number five. That is the pentagram. And when you look at the way the mum is and the symbol of Osiris, that is the pentagram. So it, it is telling us about going beyond this, this this five centriality, which are the five wounds of Christ. You know, when you look at the eye of, of Horus and people say that it represents the pineal gland, it does, but it also represents the five senses because there are, you know, the pupil is obviously sight. The part of the eye that is closest to the nose is smell. The part of the eye that is closest to the ear is earring. You have the tongue, which is taste, and you have the teardrop, which is touch. So you have the five senses within the eye of Horus, which tells us to go through the infinite expanse out of the five centriality. So everything that they are telling us is the transmutation to human potential, not the current condition that we are in. So it, it's it really is the, the transmutation of self. And you know the Egyptian proverb is 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 to know thyself, you will know the gods, because you are the god, you are the miniature creation. Yeah, and I mean that's uh, that's fascinating. And is that, you know, we t you talk about this here, and you know, going almost detaching from the five senses. Are are we talking about an internal spiritual journey? It's one that it's through the you know pineal gland, but it's not ex you know it's not external. It's actually going inwards. Um, and obviously, you know, you've, you know, you have references in the Bible to this with you know make your eyes single and fill your light with body and uh, your body sorry your body with light. Um, is that essentially what you know the, the alchemical path is it's not you know trans you know trans going through the chakras and you know taking that internal journey and like you say balancing the the four elements is that is that what you're saying or is there more to it am i oversimplifying it am i no i mean there's, there's always more to it but when mm. when two eyes become one you enter the kingdom so if you imagine two eyes become one that gives you the pyramid yeah. so the one eye is the pineal gland, which is marked where the king's chamber is. So the, the, the two the two eyes become one, it is the pyramid. Now, when you look at the meaning of Osiris, Os, Aris means open eye. So that again, they are telling you about this inner transmutation. The, the answer to the mystery is within the mystery itself. If you wish to understand the universe, if you wish to understand nature, if you should not understand what's going on in the oceans, you must first understand yourself because you are all of those things. Now, unless you can understand what you are and where you're from and, and your potential, how can you possibly understand anything else? Now, when, when people are, you know, again, particularly our scientists and our UFO communities and, and different things, they are looking for these things in outer space. They are not in outer space. They are in inner space. The inner space is the grid of your consciousness, your bandwidth, your retrievable data. So they're not out there, they are here, but they are operating at an evolved frequency that we can't see. Now, when people turn around and say, well, what happened to the Mayans? They just disappeared. What happened to this civilization? They just disappeared. They didn't. They just changed the frequency. We can't see them, but they still exist. They are in an, un, an evolved frequency. Now, when we evolve ourselves and when we evolve our own frequency, then we'll be able to interact with these things, whether you consider them extraterrestrial or Palladian, Syrian, Mayan, it doesn't matter. They are all on an evolved frequency. And there are there is life on, on the planets of our solar system at a frequency that we can't detect. So when we go to planet Mars and it looks desolate and it looks like it's just been like a, an old factory that's been disused because that world has been disused, but not an evolved frequency world. And when you understand that everything really no, nothing can happen without first coming from you because you are universal creation everything that was used in creation the original thought of creation was you at some point until you fragmented away as an ember from the central spark so everything that is in creation is within you there is no separation between that and this you know, we, we make the sacrifice when we come into a mind of the flesh, into ignorance. But we can turn that around and ascend back to the mind of spirit, which is 
enlightenment. And that's really what, what they're telling us, the turnaround from the fall to the ascent. So everything is within you. Everything has to come from within you. But within you is universal creation in terms of elements, in terms of atoms, in terms of subatomic particles, in terms of programmed genetics that has come from elsewhere. You know, everything that we could possibly need is within inside us. You know, the kingdom of God is within you. Now, when you look at what is, when, when I say God, I don't mean the biblical God or the religious God, because that is not, that is, that is false. But when I talk about, I, I use the word God, because again, it is something that people are familiar with and can, can relate to. But to me, when I talk about God, I'm talking about the mathematical supreme mind that created a mathematical universe. So we are that God. Now, the house of God is the mind, the temple, and the body is the city of God. That is the city that was created by God, not the temple built by man. Because the Bible tells you that God is not where the, not in the temple built by man. And yet, every Sunday we're off to church, which is a mm. temple built by man. God is not there. God is here. Yeah. Because house of God, city of God. And we, once we start to realise this, once we start to realise we don't need to look outside of ourselves, that is bad teaching, that is bad programming, that, you know, there's going to be a savior coming in a white horse on the clouds, there's going to be a UFO land on, on the lawn of the White House and, and solve the world's problems. That is not going to happen because what we are experiencing now is the effect of the cause, but we are the cause and we are the ones that have to put it right. And we put it right by... And evolution, choose good over evil, evolution or devolution. If we choose evolution, if we choose the road of higher consciousness, then we can put these things right. Absolutely, yeah. And, you know, you briefly, you touched, you know, you, you touched on, you know, explaining what the the um the how the pyramids you know can reflect the mind and you know the chamber um i wanted to ask this something obviously comes from my own personal experiences obviously from vedanta um and things like that and you know pranyamic pra practices I, i've heard you you know speak before about you know the sphinx in these terms and also you know you also mentioned a moment ago about you know if your you know your your um your thoughts are out of balance you know your air element would be out of balance um, and that ties that ties in you know quite not quite neatly really with that because that's also do all to do with breath and pranayama and things like that um could you just tell us a bit more about that and how that relates how you know the sort of eastern practice of pranayama relates to um you know the e e ancient egypt Again, it's, it's all connected. I mean, when you, when you look at the East, when you look at the Orient, when you look at Oriental, it just means to orientate yourself to the light because East is where, where the sun rises, the illumination. So Oriental is orientating yourself to the light. Now, a lot of these Eastern practices and, of course, Egyptian practices, you know, you see Egyptians next to bees, you see them as bee people. Why? Because certain breath techniques that ignite the fire within you are replicating the, the vibration of a bee. That is why the many Indian bloodlines have the symbol of, as, as, uh, of a bee. Egyptian royalty have the symbol of a bee. In Roslyn Chapel, it is set to the gestation temperature of a beehive. It is an important thing. Now, when you look at the word spirit, it means breath. So spirit really is breath. Now we have God who creates with breath. We have such words as conspiracy. Conspire means to breathe together. Mm -hmm. You have inspire, which means to breathe. You have the church expire, which means to breathe. You have ex expire, which means to stop breathing. So when you start looking at all of these ancient practices and the correct breath technique, for argument's sake, the tribe of Judah, which is the Sphinx, tribe of Judah means the breath of the lion. Now, the breath of the lion is where you sit with your fingers in the shape of a lion's paw, and you sit in a cobra position, which is why the cobra is so important in Egypt and other places. And you breathe correctly, because what you are doing then is you are activating certain things within you, within your taking back 
the breath from the subconscious mind. Now, we are talking the Holy Ghost, the Holy Spirit, is the breath controlled by the subconscious. Now, when your superconscious, your conscious and your subconscious work together, that is the Trinity, the Holy Trinity. And it's, it's through certain breath techniques, spiritual practices, that you ignite these things within you. You push up your Kundalini serpent energy, mm. your Isis, and you take it to Osiris, the open eye. So it, it is all it is breath technique that really goes intrinsically. You know, the Sphinx has now knows why, because you know you, you, when you're in spirit, you don't need a nose to breathe. It's talking about a higher level of things through through breath, through the activation of breath. And there's so many different words that, that, that are compatible with that. There's so many different practices that they were doing. It is all about the correct breath techniques, and, that, and that's what they were doing. Yeah, it's really interesting. And I, I can see the, there's some similarities there already with, you know, you're talking about the, the Trinity and the, you know, yeah, I've heard it, it, it talked, talked about in Vedanta as, you know, the different states would talk about this state as, of it is sort of Turiya consciousness um, where, you know, you have the sleep state, the waking state um, and, you know, the deep sleep state and your Turiya consciousness is when you, your full consciousness has grasp of all of them and has awareness in all of them. And um, it, it sounds so similar and it's such a parallel um, to, to what you're talking about in your research. It's, it's you know, it's incredible the you know, the, the depth to the different cultures this goes and it goes to. Something else I, I wanted to, to to sort of touch on with, with you, um, which I might I, I haven't I can't say I've heard you talk about before, but it it may be something that you know definitely works its way into your work is um, sort of the the esoteric themes that you're talking about, you know, rearing their you know their head in Hollywood, um, you know, sort of being not just Hollywood but art and things, but they're sort of hidden in plain sight. Um, you know that same sort of alchemical tale um but sort of woven into hollywood films and um you know music and things like that is, is that something that that's come up in your work and yeah it is um, again when, when you look at our accepted reality the matrix that we live in it is basically the subconscious world that is understanding things through symbols so when we are all seeing the same symbols time and time again we, it forms basically an overlay, a matrix over, over the subconscious mind, which creates an accepted reality. Now, Hollywood, the same as the music industry, the same as the film industry, the same as the, the car logos, brand logos, they are geometric symbols. Now, symbols is the language of the masters that presented the sacred mysteries to the advanced students because they tell them how to interpret the symbols, which goes in at a real sort of subconscious level. Now, when you start looking at Hollywood, the wood of the holly tree. That is what the Druids used to use in their in their magic. Now, when you look at Druid, it means knower of oak trees, knower of oak knowledge. So the original method of, of codes was carving symbols on the barks of trees. Hmm. Now, Druid, knower of oak knowledge. Now, when you look at a tree, you will see the leaves, you will see the bark, and there's, the bits that you can't see are the roots underneath the ground. The roots symbolize hidden knowledge, the unseen. Now, when you are a blasphemer, which has a negative connotation, but really to blaspheme means to uproot. So if you are blaspheming, you are uprooting knowledge from the unseen world and making it manifest in the seen world. So I'm quite happy when somebody says that I'm a blasphemer because <laughs> yes, I am, because you don't understand what it means. So, yes, Hollywood, the Druids, the oak tree, everything else is real. I mean, it, it, these things even go deep into politics. You know, the, the, the Conservative Party used to have the oak tree as their, their symbol. Winston Churchill was a Druid. When you start looking at the, 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 the Labour Party, you know, their, their symbol is the red rose. The red rose is a symbol of the Yoni, the Holy Grail. Now, when a lady is given birth, what happens? 
she goes into Labour. <laughs> so here, even in deep in politics, we have the roles, we have Labour, we have the we, we used to have the old treat. It's now a, you know the, the Liberal Democrats, which is a dove, which is all to do with the, uh, the the brainstem, which which forms the shape of a dove and different things, and. It goes deep into politics, it goes deep into Hollywood, it goes deep into the music industry, music, muses. And it is really creating this accepted reality for the subconscious world and by the use of symbols. Because the world, the language of the world is not English, not American English, it's not Japanese, it's not Chinese. It is symbols and codes. Mm -hmm. And when you understand the symbols and the codes, you see things in a completely different light a completely different way to those who cannot see what you can see. If I was to give someone a Bible now and they would literally read it like a book. It's not meant to be read like a book. You know, when you go from Genesis to Revelation, Genesis is the genitals. And that is where the electricity, the arc, the arc of the covenant goes all the way at an angle, arc angle, archangel, and activates your consciousness so the ark of the covenant is within you and it is it is stored in the temple of solomon which is there yeah. now the king's chamber represents the pineal gland and the great pyramid represents the mind so inside the king's chamber you have the sarcophagus biblically the measurements and the size of the biblical ark of the covenant is the exact same size as the sarcophagus of the Great Pyramid inside the King's Chamber, which replicates the mind. That is the Ark of the Covenant. So Genesis to Revelation, genitals to the revealing, is the Exodus, is the completion of Noah. It is talking about the inner processes of consciousness and the enlightenment. And that is what they're telling us. Wow. Yeah, that's fascinating. Uh, you know, you blew me away there with the the definition of you know the carvings on the you know the, on the wood and the the, ho the the wood of the ho the you know the holly tree. That's that's fascinating stuff. Um, are, are there any sort of particular things that you 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 know personal favourite films or perhaps you know particular symbols that you would point out to us you know from Hollywood or any, anything of note that you yeah, I mean, what one of my my favourite films for obvious reasons is The Da Vinci Code, and because even though Dan Brown turned that into a novel, so he could sort of get it in the sideway, there's a lot of symbols and, and truths in 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 that novel, in that in that so-called story. Uh, Mary Magdalene was not the wife of Christ. Mary Magdalene is the Vesica Pisces. It is it is sacred geometry, but literally every single symbol of Hollywood you know some of my favorite symbols are the pentagram which again is the symbol of the mysteries every time I see a film or, or I see a thing I was watching a, a Madonna video the other night from the 80s and there was a house number above a door that kept appearing on this video and I thought that there's some significance to that and it was 1318 now when I look at Revelation verse 13 18 he talks about 666 and the number of the beast and so everywhere you look in sometimes in the most innocuous of places that is a symbol that is a message and it is only that the eyes that can see that will see these symbols and will see these these things so do I have any particular I don't necessarily have any particular favorite symbols other than all of them now every time a car comes past me every time I'm behind a car and I see the logo every time somebody walks past with a brand name there's a logo that I'm looking at every time I see a music video or a film I'm looking out for the symbols more so than actually watching the movie because I know that there's multiple levels of communication going on yeah. there's the there's the film you know you, you have speaking you have to signify and you have to conceal so most people are watching the speaking I'm looking at the signs and what what they're concealing so so you have different levels of communication going on and depending upon what you are looking for is what you'll see yeah fantastic yeah and I, I i definitely agree with that last last part um you know there's there's lots of different schools of thought on 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 this in terms of you know there are lots of people who who would say that you know there are bad you know uh, fraternities of people and 
groups that are conspiring to keep knowledge from people and you know things like that um and then the other way to look at it is possibly you know that well you don't you don't when you when a child learns to play you know, with a new toy you don't show them how to use the toy you want them to work it out you want them to do it for themselves and you know solve the mysteries of the toy themselves and i often wonder if the you know the bad guys and the stereotypical elitists or you know illuminati or these i i often wonder whether this is part of the, the you know the cosmic you know play the drama that you know you need those things you're you know it wants you to be curious you want you know the, the it's a mystery that needs to be solved but you're not going to be given the answers you know if if um you know if someone becomes unenlightened on the hill he's not going to tell he's not going to tell you about it he's probably gone hasn't he so you've got to work it out for yourself is that what's your perspective on it do you think there is some sort of dark side to this that doesn't want us to know or do you think it's more of a that's just part of the you know the the game that's that's one aspect to it if, if you realize that the game that we're all playing the movie that we're all acting in hmm. has already been scripted has already been concluded so we are really now if you imagine that again put it in in, in a, an example as a movie you have a script writer that writes the, the you know the the, the plot what's going to happen yeah. you have the actors who read that script who then act what is written and then you have the conclusion which the script writer knows the conclusion sometimes the actors don't we are the actors we don't know the conclusion but the conclusion has already been written by the script writer so the things that we are doing now has already been concluded there is there is an element of of people who don't want us to know this kind of information sure. because and and there's there's different reasons for that if you imagine again the young initiate is known as a child because the child is fed on milk and not until the child is ready to eat meat to eat solids will he get the solids yeah. so in other words until the initiate is ready he will not get the sacred information the child has to become ready for the meat has to become ready for the solids in order to, to be given that so there are many reasons one of them is you know they they get advantage over knowing things that we don't there's also a a reason that a lot of this information is sacred information that they wanted to protect that they didn't want the children to know because it can be misused if i turn around to you and say now that every god that we worship on a planetary sense is a kabbalah magic code that was taken from egypt so when you look at the gods names or the names of the gods it is a twofold threefold or fourfold magic formula now when you say certain letters in certain ways with a certain frequency it evokes energies but in order to evoke these energies they were creating sacred space and the geometric signs that they used to create these sacred spaces were circles and triangles now when you look at every single ancient monument and monolith of this world what shape are they they are circles or triangles mm -hmm. so a lot of these things in the wrong hands would be absolute catastrophic because you have to be you have to have for one you have to have the right intent for, for two you need to know how to say these words how to say these these sequences of letters you know and and what is what is a word really it, it is a sequence of letters so you know in the beginning was the word but we 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 can't in, in our in our current state of immaturity we can't be held responsible or we can't be given this kind of information because it could be dangerous and however when you look at sacred knowledge when you look at egyptian star codes which was taken by the hebrews and encrypted within the hebrew calendar which was taken by the knights templars because it was hidden in the dead sea scrolls and i've actually found where they've hidden them within rosalind chapel however if you look at the Egyptian star codes, you look at the Hebrew calendars, if you look at what the Dead Sea Scrolls are telling you, you can date, you know, not only the Great Pyramid and other things by these things, but it tells you that the 17th, on the 17th 360 year cycle, the knowledge will be re-emerged. Fortunately for our generation, that is now. So if you imagine a, a time capsule of knowledge that was set through the waters of time, 
guided by the stars of the sky, set at a time where this knowledge would be of most use or would stand the most chance of it being successful, that is now. That is the 17, 360 year cycle of the Egyptian star charts when, the, when this, this knowledge was meant to, to re-emerge. More and more people are looking, more and more people are trying to find the truth. You know, the Kemet truth, hmm. they are trying to find it. And when you are looking for it, when you are open to it, when you are mature, spiritually mature enough to receive it, you will receive it. And that's, that's how it's, that's, that's, that's really fantastic that we should be in that position to be entrusted with this kind of knowledge to be re-emerged. But yes, there are those who don't want us to, to have that knowledge because it serves them well to have the advantage over us. You know, they understand the matrix, they understand the symbol, they understand how reality works, how the psyche works, how the subconscious works. You now, when you look at Greek naked pictures, you know, naked images and naked statues of women, mm. that was not sexual exploitation, it wasn't porn pornography. Mm. It is scientifically proven that when a man sees a naked woman, his pupils dilate. Now, when the pupils dilate, it gives you an open doorway to the subconscious, to the soul, to the most innermost of man. Now, when a woman sees another woman holding a child, her pupils dilate, which is the gateway directly to her soul, to her, her subconscious. So that is what they were doing. They were entering the gateway of, of, of your innermost by these things. So yes, there are those who want to hide it. There are those that wish to hide it because they wish to protect it. And certainly a lot of them wish to, wish to protect it from the priests of the church because the priests of the church have now really do want the keys. They really do want the, want, want these magic formulas. Uh, but they, it was also kept away from them as well. Wow, yeah. And I mean, even the, you know, does, it, I mean, does that sort of... The, the, the example you gave there of you know the, the pupils opening the gateway to the soul and you know you gave the example of the man and, and of the woman and you know do, i mean does that relate to like a almost like a merge a duality like the dissolution of duality there the, the masculine and the feminine you know you've that was there was almost the gateways opened by that unifying of the two opposites is, is that something is that a theme that occurs in within your your research um well, the, the, the union of, of opposites is is a big thing because it represents balance. Now, unless mm. you have balance within, then you are going to be obviously imbalanced and you, you're going to go to either that side or that side. Duality really is when nothing creates, it becomes number one. Now, number one is, is the polar opposite of zero. So when you look at the number 10, it is something returning to nothing. When you look at zero one, it is nothing becoming something. But when you create something, you create duality. It is the it is the endless dance that that enables you to mirror in order to to reflect, in order to to yeah. you know to, to see different things. So duality is is a natural thing. However, duality is the effect. It is not the cause. The cause is the trine, the trinity, the neutral. Now, in order for these two opposites to exist and not annihilate each other, you have to have a third, you have to have a neutral. So the number three conquers duality, and that is why number three is extremely important, again, in ancient circles. So when you need to unify opposites, again, that, that is all part of, of, of the balance of self and the balance of within and the balance of without. But it's duality is, 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 a, is an illusion. It, we have to get ourselves to a place of non-duality to just step back in the middle ground and observe mm. and yeah. not get too transfixed into the quicksand of that side or the quicksand of that side. When when I spent a little bit of time within the New Age community when I first awoken, shall we say, that I, I, I sort of veered towards the New Age community because they seem more open to, to the experiences that I was having because, you know, they, they believe in, in, in different things. And... Mm. I soon realised that they were saying, don't concentrate on the dark, you must always concentrate on the light. But then I realised that that philosophy is creating an imbalance. Mm. Because yeah, when the universe was so. created, it was created 50-50, what we deem to be negative, what we deem to be positive. Now, you have mm. to balance those two aspects of self, otherwise there's 50% of you 
you know, it's like you've gone to the gym and you just work on this arm and you have massive muscles, but that this one's puny and nothing's happened to it. You have to have a balance within, and that is both dark and light. That is the Masonic checkerboard. That is the shades, the, the, the feminine and masculine dimensions. We have to have the balance of the two. But when you realise that I don't see the tree, I don't see the mountain, I am the tree, I am the mountain, because mm-hmm. all of that that I see is within my reality there is no separation there is no difference and when you start to see things in that way it becomes a non-dualistic sense and that's where we should be heading towards and not getting too transfixed in the negative or the positive or, or let's 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 go to this side and, and ignore that side or let's go to that side and ignore that you must work on both of them worship is work ship it is the work on your own vessel and that's what we have to do yeah, it's fascinating, and uh, you know, again, that that it sort of reminds me of a, a text I, I've I've sort of been reading recently, which is called the the uh, the Vigyana Bharavya, which is um, again, it's a it's from Kashmir Shaivism, and you know, it, it's uh, I think it's it was written in the seventh century, but it, it's it's one hundred and twelve meditations on, uh, you know, almost exactly doing that, you know. Um, trying to connect with God consciousness and dissolve duality and things like that. And it's interesting that, you know, one of the things it talks about is it it, it delivers this story of, um, you know, it it personifies, you know, subject, subject and the object like you were talking about, you know, um, and how, you know, one of the meditations in it is, is meditating on the, the void within you. So it's you know you're you're feeling the void in within you and above you and below you and that you're not supported by anything and that it's all void and you know that ties in really with what you say about the balance like you're saying of some new age communities talking about just see the light just be positive and you know I've heard a lot of those things in the past and you know that does like you say create an imbalance um, and it's interesting just to you know have something I'm reading at the moment being sort of validated by you know a completely different area of research so yeah that's fascinating what, what, what you find is regardless of, of which which bus you take yeah you always end up at the bus stop at the yeah. yeah and whether that's you know shamanism whether that's guru which means it's better of darkness it's better of ignorance whether that's egyptian babylonian it doesn't matter that when you are on a path of truth and it's validated truth it's not just a belief because that's just a convenient comfort but when it is a validated truth you find that they are all saying the same things, but in different ways. Mm-hmm. Now, one one may in in the east of the world may describe it as crimson, and in the west of the world we may describe it as red. But nevertheless, we're talking about the mm-hmm. same thing in different ways, with different yeah. descriptions, with different terminology. Now, when you start looking at, you know, Shiman, which means to hear, when you start looking at the the Sumerian Enki and Enlil story, Enki really means to hear, to listen. And that, that's telling you to go into meditation and listen to your inner sounds. Yeah. Now, when you listen to your inner sounds, that also connects you to the fifth chakra, which is the which is the throat. Now, within the throat, we have the Adam's apple. Now, if you use words correctly, now the, the, the tongue has no bones, but it can destroy you or it can uplift you. So when we start cursing people and, and whatever, we are misusing Adam's apple. It is the fall within Eden. Now, Eden basically means to judge with the eyes, the physical eyes. You must close your two eyes and see with with the one. So, when you look at the the Enkin and their story, look look within. You now look, listen, listen, speak, seek knowledge, give knowledge, transmit knowledge. That is what all these saying, and that then brings in the Sumerian cuneiforms and the Sumerian scrolls into the same mix as well. When you look at Atlantis, what is Atlantis? Atlantis is the pineal gland, which sits above. The 33rd vertebrae known as atlas now atlantis means the island of atlas so when you see atlas holding up the world holding up the world he's holding up the seat of consciousness which is atlantis mm-hmm. the lost city of atlantis and when you look at lemuria and they talk about walking snake people walking snake people is telling us if someone has gone through a metamorphosis so a walking snake person is is a wise adept who has gone through a certain process to become a wise adept that is what they are telling us when you look at the heads of easter island and only the heads can be seen that is telling you to concentrate on the divine mind 
and not the body of senses. When you look at the, when you look at the body, they are 33 feet tall. Now, 33 comes into Christ, the age Christ died, the amount of vertebrae of the spine you have. Yeah. You know, you have the 33rd parallel, which is where the Roswell crash was. When you look at, again, what I was talking about, the, the fornix of, of the brain and the vault and the cave, the tomb. Now, the only energy that can get through the pillars of Hercules, which is the two anterior pillars, where you must, you know, only the aisle, only the Christ can, can reside. Yeah. You can only go through there and there's only certain energies that can go through those pillars. Now, the energy of the fornix is called the four amen, F-O-R-A-M-E-N, forever and ever, amen. And then that brings you to amen ra, it brings you to amen, which, which in English, Demetria, amen, means 33. So we have 33 where Christ died, 33 vertebrae of the spine, which is where Atlantis is. You have the four amen, which is the energy that goes through the pillars of Hercules. All of these things relate to the Golgotha, the place of skulls, which also has the same meaning of Galilee. Google, Google, the search engine Google is Galilee, which is the mind, the Golgotha, the place of skulls. It all relates, regardless of what civilization you wish to focus on, they say the exact same thing, but in a different way. Yeah, yeah fascinating. Um, and I'm very familiar with the number 33. I uh, was fixated on that number for a while. It, it kept haunting me in many synchronicities. Um, in fact, our band actually wrote an album called 33 out of that. So, yeah, I'm very familiar with the 33. So in terms of other experiences and, you know, uh, I've read, you know, about you, you spoke about uh, UFOs in terms of, you know, higher consciousness and things. like. How do they relate to, to your journey, um, you know, and your own personal experiences there? Is that, um, you know, that's something I'd, I'd, I'd like to hear about. Well, I've had quite a number of, of, of UFO experiences. I, I've stood next to a being not of this world. I've seen beings not of this world come through portals, which are simple mir mirrors. Now, when we look at a mirror, it is really a dualistic reflection. It's the opposite way around of, of what other people see of us. So a mirror is duality, but it's all, they're, they're also used as portals. Now, I've, I've seen things come out of them to stand next to me. I've, sit, I've, I've stood next to beings not of this world. I've seen UFOs come through gateways in the sky. I've seen discs, I've seen cigar shapes, I've seen teardrop shapes, I've seen things that didn't even look solid. So when you look at the UFO phenomena, yeah, a lot of the UFO community seem to be satisfied with the metallic tin can of the sky and, and never look yeah. at never, never ever think to look beyond you know, the interdimensional travel, the, the, the different things. The, the reason that these extraterrestrial beings use craft is because they're not spiritually mature enough to not need them. Now, when you have intergalactic interdimensional energies, they don't need anything other than themselves to get to different places. So what we are seeing is advanced technology, but they need to be a lot more advanced to not need that technology. So we have really, when, when the soul comes in, and if it's a, a higher developed soul, it, it prefers to have a higher vibrational parent or parents to come into because normally it will come in through the gateway through the chakra that that the parents uh, should we say uh, hang around so if they are an enlightened couple and they operate mainly from the higher chakras then a higher dimensional soul comes into the higher chakras now as you can imagine on this earth at the moment the lower vibrational souls can incarnate anywhere because yeah. most people are in a state of low consciousness and a, and a low spiritual maturity so you can get that the lower vibrational undeveloped souls coming in quite easily anywhere they, they choose so sometimes when there isn't the parents available for these higher higher dimensional souls they even have to come in somewhere and then develop so if you imagine you know you are an absolute fantastic astrophysicist a fantastic scientist you are a rocket engineer and you are born in a third world country that doesn't have that opportunity for you to to develop those skills you have to move to somewhere that that is like america or somewhere so so sometimes the soul will have to come in and then 
move to America or, or move somewhere where where it can develop within its reality. Sometimes those those souls have to go to other star systems and incarnate in other star systems. Yeah. That is what we are seeing. They are basically souls that have incarnated in a different star system to, to ours. And when you say that, you know, how long have they been visiting? Well, they've always been here mm. because because our genetics are programmed elsewhere and because our physical body that we're now sitting in or, or a seemingly physical body is not physical, but what we believe to be a physical body came from an exploding star in the Orion Nebula, which created for the triple alpha effect, carbon and oxygen, which gives us the body that we're now sitting in. So when we are born, we are a youngster, we are a young star. Now, this this star believed that it was dead, it, it was the end of its days, but it's now living on in me, it's now living on in you. And when we pass from this body, we will live on in something else. And that is how it works. So if our, our DNA is programmed elsewhere, our physical languages are reflecting genetics. If our body was not created on Earth, then that tells you that we're not native to this planet, we ended up here. And they ended up in other places in the solar system. But I would go as far as saying that some of them were here before we were and we're the aliens. <laughs> because, you know, you, again, you have these things. It's not in outer space, it's in inner space. And when you match their frequency, when you've evolved to match their frequency, then you will begin to interact and you will begin to see them. A lot of my encounters have been glimpses through the window of things that we wouldn't ordinarily see glimpsing through a window into the unseen world because at that moment you know we all came together on the same frequency and we all saw each other <laughs> yeah, and then they just drifted out they didn't move anywhere it's just that my frequency then returned defaulted back back to its normal and then they just carried on so th there's a lot of things going on in, in the unseen now if you imagine that the frequency spectrum of everything 100 percent of everything as humans, we are seeing a lot less than 1% of that 100%. So the unseen world is 99. unseen world that we can't see. Yeah. That is yeah. where, that is inner space, that is not outer space. Yeah, no, that's, that's great. And a lot. I think a lot of people struggle with the idea of inner space. Um, and also, you know, the notion that, you know, some people say we're all one. Um, and and they're kind of similar and they go hand in hand um but i mean one of the things that somebody said to me once which really made me think about it differently and and um you know i, I get that sort of sense from yourself is they said to me you know if if you can't think of things as connected or as one or you know being within you know then just think about you know what we did scientists would describe cells in your body you know you have lots of different cells they're part of you they're part of your body but you don't talk to them you don't see them you've never seen them but they're all separate but yeah at the same time they're all part of you um and that just for me solved the equation because i just thought well that's so true isn't it so even though you know you and i are sat in a different room on a you know other ends of the country you know it, the, the two cells being part of one thing and you know one you know it, it just makes sense and you can't deny that and you know it's it's fascinating to hear that and to hear that you know even other entities like you, you're talking about you know the things that you've seen and come across and have been standing next to you that they are you know there's no need for fear with those things that they are you know just another another you know another cell that's you know part of the bigger whole you know it's it's um yeah and when you, when you expand upon that and you say that all of our trillions of cells each have an individual consciousness and each of them comply to a universal law within the dimension that they exist within at that particular time now when when these cells and these subatomic particles can exist in in a state of superposition which is multiple states at once although we can only see one of that state you know when, when i look at a tree i see the bark but i don't see the, the, the wave collision, the wave interaction that creates the shape of that bark. I'm only seeing one probable outcome of many. So they are all in, in a state of superposition, multiple states at once. And they can choose to be a wave or to be a particle. So that demonstrates that they have a decision-making process. They have a consciousness because they know what state they're currently in. 
and they also know when they're being observed because photons are being rebounded off them. So they know that they're being observed and they behave differently. So if we have all of these things that can choose and they can choose to be in a particular moment in space and time, a moment in space and time, I mean a specific location, the very fact that we are able to have this interaction means that our subatomic particles and our atoms have chosen to allow it. Yeah. The very fact that people are able to watch this in the future means that, that their subatomic particles have chosen to be in this particular moment now in order for them to see it. Yeah. Now, when you look at everything is, is one, if you put it in, into, into computer terms, because I, I think that reality is, is computer software. So if you look at the central processing unit, which is what I was saying is the supreme mathematical mind. Now, in order for that supreme mathematical mind, the central processing unit, to relay information back to itself, it had to fragment. Now, each and every one of us are a fragment of the one. Now, at some point, when these communications no longer are needed, then in computer terms, we begin to defrag. Now, the defragmentation is what others would describe as the return to singularity. Yeah. Yeah. And we are all, when you have a bonfire on bonfire night and you see all the little embers shooting off, they are sparks from the central fire, and so are we. Fantastic. I mean, I, I have no way of, I've tried to think about this before. I've never, I can't even conceive what that would be like, the singularity. And I often wonder if it's all the consciousness coming together and realizing they're one, but I, I have absolutely no idea. I, I can't even conceive it. Um, it's like, yeah, I'd, I'd like to know, to think that at some point we'll all have that ability, but. Yeah, at this moment in time, I think I'm a million miles from it. But, well, I, uh, I say to people, uh, really, as, as sort of a positive affirmation, really, and, and sort of a power tool, that if you imagine that before anything is created, something has to think about it. <laughs> so you, you think about it, and then you manifest it. So originally, each and every one of us was once a part of the original mind, the supreme mind that fought what it believed itself to be into manifestation, into reality. So if you go out tonight and look at the planets and look at the stars, you created that. When you were part of the single mind, that was your idea. Now you are looking at your creation. It's like an artist putting a painting on the wall that he or she has just painted. You are looking at your own work when you look at the universe, when you look at the stars, because at some point, you were part of that one mind, yeah. one mind that fought everything into existence. Now you are looking back at that thought and you are living that thought. And at some point you will return to being that one thought once again. All this is happening in the gigantic mind of the creator. Yeah. Yeah. Which is absolutely. Us. Yeah. Yeah. No, that is fantastic. I think you put that really well. Um, You know, considering the state of the world at the moment, you know, that's that, that kind of outlook really does bring a, you know, a positive outlook and it, it's something that, you know, hopefully will filtrate its way through to, to more and more people. Um, and I think I, I, I wanted to, to sort of it, sort of end really with, with asking you a question um, related to, to the to the current state of the world, you know, with, you know, pandemics and war and corruption and protests. Um, you know, some would say we, you know, some of the people I speak with say we're in this, the, 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 the Kala Yuga stage of, you know, existence or, you know, revelation of the Bible or, um, you know, some say we're moving towards, you know, a tyrannical sort of big brother state and things like that. I just wanted to get, to get your take on it, especially with your background and, you know, your research, um, and where, where, where you think we are at and if it's just a part of consciousness and things like that, you know, what, what's what's happening in the world at the moment? Is it something to be worried about or is it, you know? What is happening in the world at the moment is, is the effect of, of the cause that we've created. Yeah. So when you look at what disconnected us from the higher mind of the universe, sin. Now, what is sin? It just means a lack of knowledge. 
So when you return to the state of knowledge, you are no longer a sinner. You are returned. You are you have repented. You have turned 180 degrees, and behold, the opposite shore. Basically, you've turned yourself around and you've returned back to the fold. What is happening is the effect of, of that cause. Now, when you look at the ancient prophets, the biblical prophets, the, the ancient people, they were readers of the stars, the celestial narrative. When you look at what science is, science is really observation. Now, the first things to ever be observed by man was the stars. Astronomy, astrology was the original science. So when you learn the movement of the stars, when you learn that when they're in certain places at certain times of the year or certain times of the great year, which is the equinox, the procession of the equinox, certain things happen. And you can say that with a degree of certainty because that's what happened last time. And everything in the universe is secular. It's just a cycle and everything repeats. And if you don't get off that cycle, it will just continue until you do. So when I when I look at the, the age of Aquarius last time and there was upheaval, and there's disruption and the financial uh, sector collapsed and there's riots in the street, then I can say that next time we have a, an age of Aquarius, that's going to happen again. Now, when 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 you look at the likes of Armageddon, when you look at the, the biblical end of the world, it's talking about the end of an age. So what we are seeing now in a lot of the disruption that we are going through is the changing of an age. And with the changing of an age, because now Aquarius is a stubborn, stubborn age, it is causing a lot of disruption. And, you know, when the Bible says, well, when you see the man in the sky, that is Aquarius, that is the that is the water bearer. So what is he talking about is the upheaval of what is happening now. If you imagine that you're playing chess and your opponent has put his, his bishop or whatever there, where, where his next move is going to check major. So what you're now doing is you realise the game is up but you're still going to make your moves until the end of the game. That is what we're seeing. So as I said previously, the, 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 the final finale, the final chapter has already been written. It's been won. It's been done. We are just moving the, moving the chess pieces, even though we know that we are checkmated. When I've looked at certain encryption, certain codes within the Great Pyramid, it speaks of humanity in a golden age. It speaks of humanity in a better place knowledge wise and consciously what we're also seeing as well is is is, is the separation of the sinners and the non-sinners the ignorant and the knowledgeable and that is becoming more and more and more obvious in, in view of the pandemic and, and in view of different things because some people are believing the narrative and some people are seeing through the narrative and the, the two is becoming a bigger and bigger divide and that to me is what the ancients were talking about as an ascension, as an ascension, which which is becoming quite obvious. So what is happening now is the opposition who wish to keep us in the dark, wish to keep us in a place of ignorance, wish to keep us in a lower vibration so that we, we will never reconnect to the higher places, are playing their final moves before we checkmate them or before they're checkmated. So the future is bright, but it's going to be dark before we get there. <laughs> yeah, fantastic. Yeah. No, so it's a great way of looking, isn't it? It's, it's almost like a, a film that, you know, we just got to sit back and watch it and, and, yeah. and, you know, think about all these things and higher consciousness and, you know, whether it's our spiritual practices or, you know, our chemical practices. It's, yeah, no, it's fantastic. Um, it's, like, it's, like, it's like watching a movie, you know, watching a horror movie <clears throat> and you're watching it and, you know, you, 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 got, you got the actor or the actress in, 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 in you know, Cabin in the Woods and you see them you know, turning their back and who's there? Anybody there? You can see who's there, mm -hmm. but you're trying, you're trying to tell them there's a danger. Now, this is this is what we're doing in terms of, you know, the official narrative of pandemics and different things. We're saying to the actors or the actresses, turn around, don't, don't, you know, there's mm -hmm. danger behind you. But they're not listening because they're just acting their part. We're all acting our part. We know when you when you start looking into these things, when you start to get a certain level of knowledge, when you start to get a certain level of, of enlightenment, you can see things that they can't, is what I'm trying to say. Mm. And until they are ready, until they turn round, they're not going to see it either, regardless of how loud you shout at the TV screen. <laughs> they're not going to see it until they're ready to see it. And, and that is what we are now seeing. 
you know, you have the people who can see it, who are trying to shout at the screen saying, he's behind you. And the people who are there can't see it because they're not at that level yet in order to see it. They can only see the one sphere of reality, the one sphere of existence, not the unseen world. So that, that's what we're going through. And it still doesn't stop us shouting at the screen, but <laughs> you know, the screen can't hear us and, and some people can't hear us either. Yeah. Yeah, no, fantastic. That's a, a great way of putting it. Um, well, you know, I've really enjoyed this, uh, Michael. It's been fantastic. You know, you've actually, you know, brought things in that I, you know, I haven't heard before and things that have, you know, made me think. Um, and I hope that the people that watch this, you know, take some take something to, from it too. Um, where can people find your work? You know, I know that you, you know, you've got several books, including Alchemy of the Gods. Um, you've got, you know, a documentary out. Um, and also, I know you do sort of one to ones and you do uh, tours of, you know, Stonehenge with with, um, you know, your guided tours there. Um, where can people find you and or get in touch with you or read your work? How do, how do they get hold of those things? I'm, I'm sort of all over the place in Facebook and, and YouTube, and whatever, but but if they just type my name in, they should be able to, to find me somewhere. But 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 the best way, really, the, the epicenter of everything is the website, which is michael com. from there you just have an array of you know blogs to read videos to watch different things that, that are all on there and and hopefully you can spend a considerable amount of time on there and and start to learn and, and hopefully that will put you on the path to, to, to go out and find yourself you know question everything don't believe what one person tells you go and go and look into it uh so that is probably the best best place to start and then that will lead you to, to different paths Great. Well, thank you so much for for, for for talking to me today. It's been it's been brilliant. I've really enjoyed it. Me too. Thank you very much. Pleasure.